we're going to get started here. Our session today is supporting computational research on large digital collections. We're going to do a little bit, talk a little program design, a little sort of framework recommendations, some lessons learned, and some tech demos, so hopefully mixing up lots of things. Uh, I'm Jefferson Bailey, I'm Director of Archiving Data Services at Internet Archive, and myself and Nick Rue will be presenting the first part, and then our colleagues from the Library of Congress will be doing uh, a presentation after us, so let's kick it off. Uh, so at least for this part of the talk, our outline, we're just going to talk some general challenges that we've uh, learned over the course of supporting big computational research projects. We'll talk a little bit about uh, trying to turn these lessons learned into a text and data mining platform and service, uh, do a walkthrough of the platform, and then just talk about the associated work supporting specific research teams. So the challenge, I think if you're in this session, you probably know what the challenge is. It's how to understand and address the technical, conceptual, and practical issues inherent in trying to support data-driven use of very large, generally born digital or born digital at this point, uh, collections. And we're talking in the, uh, generally in the petabyte scale. Uh, so in having supported this work over our many years at Internet Archive, I'll try to at least summarize some of the te technical practical and conceptual issues that have emerged in working with academic research institutes and scholarly teams and things like that. There's a lot of uh, technical complexity around the various formats that we're providing to these folks, especially related to, for us, IA, the web archive and the work format and how crawlers work and things like this and how large-scale web collections are built and constructed. Of course, there's other things around, things like codex for AV materials. These are not issues that scholarly researchers generally uh, bring with them uh, to, to these projects. Uh, we're generally talking about hundreds of terabytes, if not petabytes of data that we are delivering to them. So how to even give it, get it to them beyond shipping them boxes of hard drives uh, introduces lots of challenges. Once they get this material, do they have the local processing to deal with it? Some do and some don't, and some don't know that they need it when they make the original request. Uh, it, there isn't always a lot of, uh, if we're giving them data sets or derivations of these collections, there isn't necessarily great visibility into how the, how the algorithm worked that created the data set. Sometimes we're running an algorithm for them and giving them output. Other times we are creating a data set that sort of meets the need that they're asking for. And there's, of course, uh, derivation complexities for when we filter and subset and then run multiple jobs on data and then give them outputs. There's conceptual issues. The provenance of some of these collections is generally well documented, but documented often in a technical manner, not necessarily in an intellectual control manner. Uh, how the material was acquired, it could be donated to us. We could have archived it, of course, ourselves. We could have done it through a service with a collaborating library. There's different methods of acquisition, and those are sometimes difficult to describe to researchers. There's border and boundary complexities around where does the data start and end? When did a web crawl start and end? Why did it go and get these things? Why are there these elisions? And what's the breadth of the data set uh, that we can build a research corpora off of? And there's practical issues. How do they even come to us to ask for petabytes of data? There's really no great, uh, at least for our institution, we are, we're sort of an independent research library. We don't necessarily have great uh, support uh, in the staff or procedural areas for dealing with these petabyte scale requests. Uh, there's, of course, research agreements. Some of the data might be embargoed. It might, uh, it's generally all open, openly accessible public data, but of course, uh, how they can reshare it, how they can reconstitute it, what they can do with it after it gets to them uh, evokes questions. Of course, there's budget and staff and program complexities. So these are sort of the models that we've tried to explore in getting people many, many terabytes slash petabytes uh, of data. Bulk data model, give it all to them, either over the internet or over internet two or something like that, or shipping hard drives or filling hard drives and they come and pick it up from us in a truck or something like that. But basically just give them the data in raw form. Uh, put the data on restricted access hosted infrastructure in our own data centers, which we own and operate ourselves. So we're doing this in a way that we can have high control over it and then give them access to it there and they can run their own jobs. 
Uh, they can roll their own scripts, algorithms, applications, give those to us, and we can run them. If they can't do that or if they don't have a high performance computing cluster themselves, they're, so that's one model, the roll your own. Middleware is trying to figure out software solutions that can sort of broad, bridge the cyber infrastructure and roll your own model where there's some customization that they can do even if they don't have direct access or control uh, over the data jobs. We give people a lot of derived or extracted or filtered data sets, so prepackaged. We can generally create those before a researcher might request it because it's a collection that's of high interest or it's a format that we know people use like sort of graph things or topic models or things like that. So in some, in some cases you can prepackage data sets that will then facilitate downstream uh, research and scholarly use. And then of course all of these have their own attendant support and community models for education, training, workshop, collaborative, Jupyter notebook development, whatever the case might be. Uh, so what are some of the practical lessons we've learned? Uh, well, large digital collections can be unkind to traditional methods of scholarly inquiry. This is certainly uh, a big issue for us in that we have lots of, we have web, we have digitized, we have text, audiovisual, uh, television, live television archive. Um, so there's just so many different formats and topics and curatorial methods, acquisition strategies, that if someone's coming in just looking for something that is you know, the published works of this type of creator from this type of community from this time span, it can just cross, uh, uh, a data set from that can cross hundreds of collections and many types of formats, and that can be very difficult for them to use uh, because they have to be handled separately. So trying to create pre-existing data sets, subsets, extractions, guides, whatnot to help uh, to help them understand that complexity has been important. Uh, the technical and conceptual issues that I mentioned on previous slides, we have people that come and request uh, multiple petabytes of data and they, they do not have their own high performance computing cluster to work with. They think they're gonna work with it on their laptop. I have no idea how they think they're gonna do this. Sometimes they just don't understand the scope and scale of the data that is available for a specific topic like disinformation or COVID. Um, so, helping them work through some of those technical issues up front, but then also how that informs their research question, their sort of corpora building to answer that question or to run uh, analysis jobs against. Um, people always think that more data is better data and more data, more data plus better data equals better research equals tenure, fame, and profit. And uh, that is definitely not the case, um, especially when you get into very broad disciplinary areas that can end up being, yes, petabytes of data that could be suitable for research. So trying to help them navigate the sort of what's available to what will be useful to what will be actually capable, they will be capable of working with has been important. And then often they're aggregating data that we might give them with data that they are getting from other places like, uh, you know, journal content from their university journal subscription data agreement thing or from Wikimedia or from Open Commons uh, digital collections. So working with them to understand how the data that we are giving them might complement a larger corpora that they are building for their research project has been important. So here's just some examples. We've tried notebooks, we've tried APIs, we've tried sort of interactive Kibana style dashboardy things, prepackaged data sets. So all that sort of typology I talked about earlier, we've made attempts at to varying degrees of success. Um, so the, but the project that we're gonna talk about a little bit, and I'll wrap my part up, uh, is that uh, Archives Unleashed project, which has been a long running project that has been working to focus on the web archive and historical internet content and make that accessible to scholars, uh, has been also working at that, that effort at the same time that we, Internet Archive, were working in, at this effort, and uh, with generous support from the Mellon Foundation, we've been combining uh, our sort of computational research support services, and especially our infrastructure uh, and our software and tooling uh, to do a, a combined project. So uh, we have this project called ARCH, the Archives Research Compute Hub, uh, with the goals to standardize our tools and services, to co-locate the data in the compute, uh, within the IA run data centers, which has been just important for processing petabyte scale information is to have data and compute at the same place. Uh, adding much more sort of 
directly supported and embedded scholarly research teams to work with us as we build out the platform, which is not something we had really had the capacity to do ourselves at Internet Archive. And we've been uh, working on this project since 2020 and are about to release the platform and have uh, 20 to 30 libraries, archives, museums involved in the pilot, as well as 50 scholars from uh, around the world. So I'm going to pass it over to Nick to talk more about the Arch platform. Hey, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk about Arch, the Archives Research Compute Hub, for a little bit, and talk about some of the, the, the other kind of second part of the overall Mellon grant we have, which is working with our cohorts, so a group of five different research teams that are doing research using this uh, platform that we've built. Um, uh, and I'm going to probably be kind of frenetic and wave my arms, so hopefully it makes sense. Um, so Arch, the platform itself, the Archives Research Compute Hub, it's an interactive web application. Um, so it's being used by collection, uh, collection curators, so people that subscribe to Archive.it. Um, so it's set up for Archive.it users to use it, but it's also set up so that you can just be a researcher that says, hey, I want to use these web archives, um, and I want to be able to do this type of analysis. It's set up and ready for that, and we're actually using uh, that with all of our, our research teams that are doing it. Um, as of right now, you can generate and download over 20 derivative data sets. Uh, from a given web archive collection, and those also connect out to Google Colab uh, to do further analysis on them, depending on the size of uh, the derivatives, because some derivatives are too big to work in Google Colab. Um, we did three rounds of UI and UX testing. We took uh, great care in this uh, to, to actually do UI and UX in this, as opposed to the, the cloud thing that I made a few years ago. Um, some of the people, some people in this room were a part of that testing and, and their feedback and everything made uh, the platform even better. Um, in addition, uh, there's in-browser visualizations for each one of the data sets uh, and data previews, so you can kind of see uh, what you're, what you're uh, going to get. Um, and then the most important thing compared to the previous version of the platform um, is that it lives at Internet Archive, and I'm not moving like 20 terabytes of data over the Internet to a compute center at the University of Victoria. Um, if you're really interested in the actual stack itself, um, it's everything here is uh, the foundation of it. Um, I'll go over this really quick. Um, the icon on the left is Sparkling, which is uh, one of two large uh, Apache Spark libraries um, that are kind of the underlying magic. Um, so Sparkling, uh, Archives Unleashed Toolkit, which is a project the Archives Unleashed project has been working on for a number of years. Uh, Apache Spark, uh, for folks that don't know what that is, it just allows like distributed computing um, across either like all the cores on a single laptop or if you have 500 laptops all around the world, you can pull them all together and do stuff. Scalatra is the web framework that we're using. It's a small little MVC uh, thing written in Scala instead of Sinatra, which would be like the Ruby one. Um, and then a, a Hadoop uh, to, you know, coalesce all those hard drives and be able to do analysis across petabytes. Um, if you're really, really interested in the, in the technology behind this, we have a JCDL paper that came out this year um, that really goes in depth on it. If you look at the slides, you can click out to it. Um, the source code, uh, this is not the, uh, <laughs> the paper, uh, the source code is also public for this, so if you want to see the algorithms that we wrote uh, to do each one of the derivatives, you can go and get that. That's at GitHub Internet Archive slash Arch. It's there. Check it out. Um, there's a Docker instance of it. You can, you can fire it up and run it on your own if you want. Um, the paper that I just mentioned, so I'm going to skip across this, um, and then just kind of go in and show you what it looks like. Um, so if you're an Archive it subscriber, you might be familiar with this interface already. Um, so it just kind of lives inside Archive it, but is a little kind of sidecar to it. Um, so if you're logged in, um, you have your collection page, which is all the collections that you have available to your Archive it account. This one, this screenshot is just Ian and I's. A uh, little test instance, there's only three things in here. Um, but from this page, basically, you can click on any one of these, which is, there's three here. Um, you have a little bit of metadata about the last time uh, a job was run, uh, the size of the overall collection, the job name, and if the collection is public or not, that's the archive at code collection. Um, and then when you go into the actual collection itself, you have another kind of landing page uh, that gives you an overview 
of the collection, so how many seeds, so we're grabbing some things from uh, the various uh, Internet Archive and Archive APIs. How many seeds are in that collection, when's the last time it was crawled, the overall size of the collection, and how large it is. So this is really beneficial for non-archive subscribers, so researchers kind of looking at it uh, to get an overview. And then uh, a table that has uh, a list of the recently comp completed jobs, and then jumping over to create a new data set. Um, and so the data sets that you can generate, uh, we have four different categories of data sets. And I'll go through them all really quick. We have the collection category, which has two derivatives. Um, the first one is a very dead simple one, which is the domain frequency. It's two columns. It's two column CSV, which is a domain and how many times it occurs in it, and that's it. Um, and then there's the Watt files, which is like an old uh, ARS uh, derivative that you can do. So we, can, so we port it over the old ARS uh, derivative programs to run in Arch as well. So that's the collection category. Uh, the second category is network analysis. So we have four different network analysis, network analysis jobs. Um, these are all CSV output except for the LGA files. Um, a domain graph, uh, crawl date, source, target domain, and count, so CSV files. Image graph, um, similar to the domain graph, um, but you also get the image links and, if possible, the uh, alt tags for it. Um, and the web graph. Uh, which is one of the largest ones. So you can take any one of these derivatives, well, the CSV derivatives, and drop them into something like Gephi and start doing for further analysis with that. Or you can load up the CSVs into any one of your network uh, analysis uh, frameworks of choice. So like if you're in Python, NetX, or something like that, NetworkX. Uh, the third category is text jobs, so getting different types of uh, playing with the text. Uh, we have an NER job, so named entities um, that you can generate. Uh, this one's in like a JSON format. It's like a bespoke format uh, that Internet Archive has. Um, then we have two other jobs, which are also CSV jobs as well. Um, the plain text of archives, uh, the web or plain text of each web page in a given archive. Um, so you get the crawl date, the last modified date, the domain, the URL, the MIME type provided by the web server and uh, Apache Tika, um, and the actual content with the HTML and the HTML headers removed. So if you're doing any type of text analysis, you have a big giant blob of text and CSV and you can do whatever you want to do with that. Um, and then further, so if you are want to study like what the HTML or any of like CSS frameworks or JavaScript frameworks like that, we have another job that leaves the HTTP headers and HTTPLN, and it'll pull out just HTML files, put them in a CSV, uh, text, plain text files, CSS files, JSON files. So there's like six subderivatives in this one that you can um, generate and download and play with. And then the final bucket is all of these file formats, so uh, audio files, image files, PDF files, PowerPoint like presentation files, spreadsheets, video, and Word documents. And you can play with all those, there's CSV with a whole bunch of columns in it. And then if you run one of these jobs, this is what the uh, data set page looks like, you get a uh, in, brow in browser uh, visualization. Uh, so this is one of the network graphs, you get a little bit of metadata, uh, and then you get a download, like a preview of what the CSV file looks like, and then the download button. Um, this is that domain frequency job, you get a nice little bar chart uh, as well, and kind of see what the top 10 looks like. And then quickly, um, this is the new collab thing I was talking about. So this is a file format job. Um, if the data set is, fits into a certain size, you can then jump over to collab and start playing with this. Uh, and this is what it looks like. We have uh, collab notebooks for, or Jupyter notebooks or Python notebooks for 12 of the different jobs. So anyone that's CSS or CSV based, uh, you can play with them in here. Um, it just basically loads them into plant pandas and walks through um, what you can do, like an example type of research. So it's, it's trying to bridge a gap that we've had, uh, that we've seen come up with a lot of our research teams. They're like, hey, I got these CSV files. Like, what do I do with them next? And this is what you can do with it. And so if you look at it through the lens of a researcher, that's one way to do it. But if you look at the lens uh, like of an archivist, another way to say is like, this is just like a big giant finding aid uh, where you take everything that's in archive it and the derivatives and all together and it's a big giant uh, finding it, and we argue our case in this paper if you want to, if you're interested in that. Um, and then finally, uh, I wish I had more time to talk about this because this is one of my favorite parts of the project is uh, we have two different cohort teams. Um, 
The purpose of them is to facilitate uh, research with web archives. Um, each one's a year long. The funding is, that's messed up. Uh, <laughs> 10K US is about 11,500 uh, Canadian. Uh, Bi-weekly calls, so we meet with each of the teams every two weeks to talk through their research and if they need anything. It's like we're both mentoring each other, um, where like Ian and I have been working with this type of data forever, uh, and a lot of it's new to them. Um, and if you're interested in their work, because um, I'm running way out of time now, um, these are the projects. They're really, really cool. They're really awesome. This is the first group. Uh, that wrapped up in June of this year. Uh, this is the second group. If you're interested in the first group, the first group uh, gave presentations uh, back in the spring and all of that video is on uh, Internet Archive. And if you check out that video, you get a bonus of uh, uh, Quinn uh, Dombrowski talking about the SUCO project and stuff like that. Um, so to wrap it up, I just want to thank uh, our, our, our supporters. Um, Mellon Foundation made a lot of this happen, of course, and, and then that's it. Hi there. Um, I'm Abby Potter. I'm a um, with LC Labs at the Library of Congress, uh, which is in the office of the Chief Information Office Officer, which is our central IT um, service unit. Um, thanks for joining us. Megan Farrader is my colleague, also in LC Labs. Um, sh uh, will be talking right after me. Um, so I'm going to share about um, some resources that we've developed to help plan and assess AI, um, the artificial intelligence technologies in a library context, um, and specifically our experimental labs context. And then um, we're gonna, Megan's going to share about the Computing Cultural Heritage in the Cloud Initiative, which um, is investigating how the library might enable large-scale data-intensive research with cloud services, and then how we're, we've used our AI plan planning framework to support that work. Okay. So um, we really see um, AI as the next, the sort of, the next in a series of waves of technology change that libraries have had to um, ride. So um, thinking about microfilm, digitization, um, online accessibility and um, availability, search and discovery, digital preservation, that, um, that with those sort of technological waves and then this AI technological wave, there are um, uh, shared, dri shared drivers and challenges um, that are sort of bringing this wave to us. Um, and some of those is that we, um, we all want to stay relevant and um, current with uh, user expectations. A lot of our users are expecting um, the content to be digital, to be searchable, to be discoverable, reusable. They want content that's relevant and connected to their specific task or goal. And they want sort of um, very granular access. And I think that the sort of data research that um, our colleague shared before is a good example of that. Um, and then in our organizations and libraries, we all have a lot of digital content and that the scale and variety of that content is going to continue to grow exponentially. Um, but our, our staff size and our technical capabilities are probably not going to grow in the same um, sort of exponential way. <laughs> um, and AI and ML do have, um, seem like they have the potential to help bring order to the, our sort of unstructured, noisy, inconsistent data and sort of help us to, um, to meet our user, to sort of meet some user needs. Um, but, but there's also some challenges. So even though our collections are really of high quality, they're vast, they're produced to our standards, they still include historic biases, they represent an incomplete record, they're selected from larger collections and are created in different contexts for various reasons. The level of description of these collections vary widely. Um, the, the resolution and quality of scans or, uh, or any audio or images also vary widely. Sometimes they include offensive material, non-factual material, and errors. So um, this is in, in all of our collections, but um, uh, the, uh, the transformations that our collections go, take uh, that, that happen as, as they go sort of through a digital pipeline um, are really the product of decisions that are made about practices and the technology available at the time. And um, we know that, some of that information, but sometimes our users don't. Um, so we, we want to know what, what would our users make of these transformations? What would an AI system make of these transformations? So, um, and then another big challenge is the, the lack of transparency for how AI and ML systems are trained and how accurate they, they work with content um, that we hold. 
um, and and sort of the the mismatch in uh, in uh, 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 sort of the knowledge and the systems that vendors are selling us, <clears throat> excuse me, and the the um, the the actual data backing up those claims that they're making, and sort of the lack of transparency of how um, uh, training data is created and how it's used and how models are trained. So. Um, with these shared challenges, um, we are thinking back to how we uh, are, um, sort of dealt with those other waves of technological, technology, technological change, and uh, sorry, uh, and, and thinking of what what can we as a sector do about it. And I think it's go going back to what we are good at, which is um, knowing our content and and um, knowing our users and um, relying on our sort of detailed. Um, ability to sort of create standards and community standards that we can, um, <clears throat> sorry, that we can uh, use um, when we work with vendors or, um, or with each other. Okay, so we're not the only, um, in labs, we're not the only people thinking about this um, or, or thinking about how we can uh, uh, use AI technology in a, in a way that works for our, for our sector. So this is just a, a, um, a quick overview of some of the, uh, um, other kind of foundational work in this area. So, and you can see sort of themes emerging from some of these. Um, the recently the OSTP released a, a different um, uh, set of information about the blueprint for an AI bill of rights. So, sort of centering the human experience in in AI. Um, the, the it's not labeled, but in the middle here there is a, um, a trustworthy AI uh, framework that NIST is working on. That's going to be um, released in January. That map out the, um, emphasize the, the level of uh, governance and maintenance that AI systems um, are required to sort of meet a trustworthy uh, standard. And then there's also, you know, some foundational ethical work and, and um, this other, uh, the IT Centers of Excellence AI Capability Model, it um, helps give a picture of the sort of how many um, elements of, uh, of um, how many sort of elements of work are involved in 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 having a mature AI system that um, it requires? You know, people, data, infrastructure, cloud, model, model security, and moving from an individual project up to sort of an enterprise level. They sort of map out different levels of how you be there. And and I think we're even. Um, I think some uh, Cliff mentioned it before that maybe we've done enough experimentation around. Uh, uh, AI machine learning, but it's hard to move to the second, you know, to up from individual to an enterprise uh, state uh, without sort of a shared idea and specific information about sort of what we're doing. So um, we, um, this is just a, a quick, this is not really meant to read, but we've been experimenting um, in labs with machine learning since uh, 2019. We held a, um, we've done events, we've done papers, uh, structured uh, the um, some work with contractors, work with innovator and residences, and um, we're uh, we we have a, a lot of recommendations. This is not the complete list, and then sort of some next steps, and you can see sort of the top and sort of the most uh, recommended <laughs> or next step that that we do is um, sort of implement des um, design principles, risk frameworks for AI and ML, uh, and. So, that's, so th these are the resources that we've developed in LC Labs, again, based on our context, which is um, in the experimental lab. Um, and, and, th this or, and this is sort of building out an organizational profile. So this was recommended in the, uh, in the tr NIST Trustworthy AI Framework. So this is, um, so we tried to think specifically about what AI would be used at the Library of Congress. And um, discovery at scale, this is sort of one, um, this quadrant, this is where we've done most of our experimentation to sort of uh, generate metadata that, uh, that uh, uh, to increase um, users' discovery of our collections. Enabling research use, that's, a, that's sort of what we think of as preparing, transforming data sets uh, so that researchers may use them, sort of what um, <laughs> uh, was just discussed before. Um, and then uh, these bottom two are two we haven't really done a lot in, so um, looking at different business cases, pro data processing, data management, digital preservation, sort of different um, ways that we might use this technology internally where the users of these systems are mainly internal staff. 
And then, um, of course, the augmenting user services of implementing things like chatbots, implementing things like um, uh, voice search over collections. So trying to think specifically about AI and not just like one giant sort of solution or system that may be, um, we may want to consider. Uh, so, and then, like I was kind of mentioning before, the required vendor documentation. So the, um, uh, uh, we've created a, dig a data, what we call a data processing plan, and we have a version of it, um, and we have it required in this new contracting vehicle that we uh, just released. Uh, it's called the Digital Innovation IDIQ, and if you're interested in that, I can talk to you about it later. But, um, but it's uh, any... Uh, data transformation that involves AI or ML, the vendors are required to fill out this really long form. And it sort of talks about, you know, things like data, data labels, model cards, which are sort of becoming more standard practice in, in sort of trustworthy AI systems, but then include things like data provenance and other domain-specific information that we want to capture. Um, so we have that information about transformation. And then other um, information about data, the data that is um, part of these transformations that we as the stewards will probably have to um, collect and maintain also. Um, and then another tool we've been working on is this matrix for assessing benefits and risks. So um, it, 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 we, we're sort of filling it out line by line or project by project and, um, and it, it is a lot of basic um, sort of project management uh, questions that you may work through but um, it also sort of uh, gets at one of the um, at some of the key issues around planning for AI, and um, one is being you know really articulating who's going to touch these systems, who's going to, um, and 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 then articulating the risks and benefits for different user groups and recognizing they may be different. So users versus staff versus or, you know, sort of organizations, and then um, really trying to document the data readiness. That's a big sort of um, uh, block for, for using these systems, and a lot of our blocker for using these systems. And uh, it, with our data, is um, it, it's it's we don't really have a lot of training data at, right now, and um, the so sort of trying to document that to sort of think about. And like I said, we are looking at this sort of project by project. But we, in the matrix, we have it organized with the, um, according also to the organizational profile. So we can, over time, look at if there's certain areas of the profile where maybe there's more risks or more benefits that we can sort of look at over time and, and think, okay, well, this is where we should um, uh, point our, our uh, prioritize our energy. Um, this is another uh, sort of, coming to the like, discussion of values and articulation of principles. So um, in our, uh, our crowdsourcing program that uh, Megan Ferrier led, uh, the Concordia, the open source um, uh, software tool that runs that program, or the technical part of that program anyway, uh, she devised some um, uh, design principles that help sort of guide deci decision making and self help sort of articulate up front um, what we're trying to achieve at a broad level with these systems. Um, and this is sort of where we, we were trying to bring these things together and think about, okay, what, if we, you know, and we've, we've kind of organized it this way where the little houses are. This is where we have sort of started, and this is where we're currently active. And um, sort of if you think about the bo at the bottom, so the um, data processing plan, um, trying to collect data about um, AI processes that are happening, adding on sort of this um, risk and benefit analysis matrix, and then building sort of building from the bottom up. You could also start from the top, where you, you um, identify, you know, short shared statements of values. So we've had some ongoing conversations with um, NARA and Smithsonian and Virginia Tech about how could we develop some sort of, could we or should we develop some st shared statements about how our organizations this, want to use AI, and then sort of building out our own profiles and. And, um, and our own statements of, uh, about how we want to use AI um, to sort of have that be a starting point. Um, so this is uh, our, we put up a, a machine, this is our, our website where you can find um, all the, the code and the papers from our experiments. And then we're starting to put some of these framework elements out here too. And, and, it's a, and we're hoping, and this is a call to, uh, to help to sort of not, um, to not be paralyzed by you know AI that's coming for us, that that we can, we 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 have done this with digitization, we've done it with digital pres preservation, where we 
you know, establish shared standards that we then communicate to the world that the world can then sort of design to. So that's what our, um, that's what our proposal is. And I'm gonna hand it off to Megan. Um, thank you very much, Abby, for handing over, and Jefferson and Nick. I think there's a lot of coherence between this. We were looking at the broader scale here with thinking about implement implementing AI and ML in our context, but this particular project, Computing Cultural Heritage in the Cloud, is a starting where we can, and it was also being developed concurrently in the same time frame as we've been exploring uh, machine learning over the last few years. So this is a, a grant that is supported by the Mellon Foundation that began in 2019. Um, these are some of the goals, and you will see that we wanted to produce models and we were going to capture costs, but we didn't account for the building, the knowledge exchange, the collaboration, the convening that happened as a part of this work, and those are some of the things that we hope to share as we are rounding out uh, this grant. I also want to uh, give thank you, uh, thanks to some of our advisory board members who are here at CNI um, and have been really active in sharing their experiences with this type of work. We also hope as we complete this grant that we'll be documenting the use and capabilities of the cloud environment, existing and possible uh, library data processing and transfer workflows, which is a lot of words to say. In our context, some of these things are more difficult than we, than we maybe anticipated, um, both from the range of thinking about scale and also shifting from a model of serving smaller scale research into broad research and the types of questions that can be asked of data uh, with appropriate documentation and scaffolding and support from subject matter expertise at the library. We also are hoping to think uh, through the required staff requirements, um, different types of feasibility um, around cloud services, and um, some of the uh, sharing findings more broadly in developing collaborative approaches in this space. Um, we have, this project has been broken into six phases, and we are in the penultimate fifth phase, moving into a transition phase. Um, these are some of the things that we've undertaken so far. Um, we had a, a little bit of a pause during the preliminary phase of the pandemic and then picked back up and brought on new staff. We've had uh, details, we've um, collaborated with colleagues across the library and done a number of knowledge exchange activities as well. So we have uh, assessed the the readiness of our uh, collections data to be used by these types of approaches, uh, both by engaging with scholars and computational researchers who were ready to ask questions of our collections, and some of our forms of data were not ready to respond to those kinds of questions. We also have documented our capabilities and some of the limitations of our cloud services um, because many of the models of our cloud services have not been designed to support user needs in this way, but they could support user needs in this way. We've supported 10 different expert researchers in two phases, one in a longer phase, so three um, researchers and uh, digital humanists and computational researchers, Andromeda Yelton, uh, Dr. Lincoln Mullen, and Dr. Lauren Tilton. And then we just recently, I'll give you a, a snapshot in just a moment of a, a data jam that we hosted with seven additional researchers, asking them to look at what had changed from the way our data were presented at the beginning of CCHC to some very specific data packaging and availability in the cloud. And just a quick note, uh, we will preview to you our emerging service model recommendations as a part of this grant. Um, primarily, some of the things we're thinking through are continuing to experiment around transforming data. That's um, very significant in our context, our LC Labs context in the library and our positioning and the, the flexibility and uh, the privilege we have to try new approaches uh, and to ask people to engage with us and give us feedback. We also, in the second, um, icon here of people whose hands are meeting together at the table, is to continue to support our users with staff roles and programs for self-service. We heard this, uh, we've heard this from a range of different types of models, including some of the things that Jefferson shared and some of the experiences of our advisory board members as well. Um, and we also know that this works very well across other means of supporting um, digital scholarship and computational research. And we just recently had feedback from our Data Jam participants about the ways that they would like to see um, uh, knowledge exchange and other forms of self-service in accessing data and data packages. We also will continue to design and use cloud infrastructure, but think about it less as a platforms as a service or infrastructure as a service, and perhaps more like data as a service. What would that mean? What are the implications? what are the um, requirements, staffing requirements and different types of resource requirements, what's also the permanence or impermanence of data that would be used in these particular ways, and then we will continue to develop staff competencies and enhance collaboration uh, strengths across our um, already extremely talented and generous colleagues uh, and partners. Um, 
So let's see, so a quick look on some of our current focus in, in CCHC. We've been uh, rounding out a large phase of information gathering and knowledge exchange with users of uh, library collections as data. And we've been thinking through the different ways that um, we may be able to make some preliminary steps and connect back to some of these machine learning recommendations that we have as well. So we've been developing data packages, um, in very specific ways, so thinking through and applying that data processing plan that Abby showed, we've used this in developing our data packages, so we are documenting transformation. Um, a broader set of um, collections cover sheets, uh, which are very similar to uh, data sheets for data sets, if you're familiar with that concept. We've been um, hosting working groups within our context and um, bringing together the shared challenges and needs across our organization. And we also have established a, a cloud services sandbox for experimentation which is called data.labs.loc.gov. As of right now, the public-facing version of that uh, includes three data packages that can be, um, that people can enact and engage with. It includes uh, data samples for uh, bulk download and then programmatic access to an S3 bucket. This is, space is also allowing us to pursue other types of experimentation um, and uh, particular opportunities for staff members to be involved and to be thinking about sharing the responsibility of managing data and access to data in the cloud. And we also continue to get user feedback. Um, in our recent CCHC data jam, we uh, brought together um, colleagues uh, from across the library to help us establish these data packages, and then we shared an invitation to engage with these data packages and provide us real-time feedback. Uh, seven experienced data wranglers access this library data through, a, through three different programmatic access pathways, specifically using a software development kit, using REST API, uh, the AWS REST API, and also using the command line interface. And we got immediate and excellent feedback that uh, trying to access data using, using the REST API in Amazon Web Services was the least effective for these researchers. So it gives us a starting point to begin to continue, or to continue the experimentation and build out some of these um, practices. This is a slide from Dr. Zoe LeBlanc's presentation, which was, uh, as many of our other uh, participants in the data jam were able to really tell us how much they wish they had more time to spend with the data sets. We only gave them uh, a month to engage with these data packages and kind of give us the feedback. And um, we were able to solicit real-time feedback on the current technical setup, um, the, the ways that people approach trying to um, blend and combine, parse, and interpret different types of data, and then um, uh, opportunities to um, improve upon the documentation from these researchers. Uh, this, we have just recently released some blog posts about this data jam, documenting these uh, pathways for developing replicable uh, data package methods. So uh, we can share those with you. Those are available on the Library of Congress Signal blog, uh, where we really were describing our particular experimentation and the, the connection and the data pipeline that we have available to us at the library and where new um, interventions need to be made within those pipelines. Here's a view into our data sandbox, data.labs.loc.gov, as I described. Uh, and I just want to move just quickly and briefly into what Abby described as some of the ways that we've been carrying forward those machine learning recommendations into the work of CCHC and then also using CCHC to um, test some of those recommendations. So one of the things is that we have articulated values at each stage of this um, grant so far and, and come back and touched on what does it mean to enact those types of values and how do we carry that forward both in the communication and collaboration but also in the practices of um, making data more accessible. Um, we are also, as, just as the um, Archives Unleashed project is sharing the outcomes of these different types of work in GitHub repositories, we've, we're sharing the work of our researchers who contributed to the first phase of uh, CCHC in, in GitHub, just as we do with our other um, LC Labs experiments, which is, includes code and documentation and training data. And then we also uh, have, uh, as I mentioned before, in our data packaging, um, followed these uh, guidelines to use a data processing plan and really thoroughly document across that way. So we anticipate in the end that we will have a, a large range of modular components of this grant outcomes. We'd really like to be able to share it with people and engage with colleagues who are in different organizations approaching very similar challenges. 
Um, one thing at the very end I'd like to point out that CCHC is a little bit amorphous as you're looking at it, it's a cloud for sure, but as it passes, we really see the artifacts and legacy of this work in the library, including in socializing these types of approaches and uh, making real some of the components of implementing ML. Uh, machine learning, and we also have, uh, along the way, improved some of our other infrastructure, including documentation of the LSC.gov, JSON, and YAML API, and other dimensions of our cloud service implementation. Thank you very much. I think we have just a couple minutes for questions, and we'll also be very happy to talk with more with you after. Are there any questions? <laughs> well, I have one question in jest, which is, is there anything that you're not doing at LC? Because <laughs> uh, that was impressive. Um, I, a, a question actually for uh, Nick and Jefferson, which may feed into the, our LC colleagues. Um, are you doing, it looked like you were doing a lot of um, I don't want to say traditional, but straightforward data mining routines. Did I, and maybe I didn't track, are you also doing any machine learning as part of what you described? Uh, for us, a couple, a couple of cases, but not a whole lot. Uh, most of our ML work is internal and not done as a response to researcher demand, but we do have a couple of cases where we have done that, and they have given us training sets and given us their algorithms and their models to run internally on collections when it was data that we couldn't give to them directly. So a little bit, but not much. Yeah, and if, if you want to call NER machine learning, um, that's about the only like AI or machine learning data set that's in the uh, Arch like packages stuff. Hi, my question is for the LC folks. How in the world did you get through the bureaucracy and get permission to use AWS? <laughs> well, uh, that's our current, or one of our current contracts for a cloud service provider. Uh, it was a place where we actually, uh, as Abby mentioned, we have about five years of LC Labs experimentation, and this is a place that we have been able to share some smaller forms of data already. Uh, it's a place where we had permissions and access already, and a place where we were able to uh, coordinate with colleagues and um, provide resource justification for using that space. I thought the data jam was a very innovative idea. And my questions have to do with, in terms of that data jam, is your final audience in terms of the data uh, generating machine learning models or better algorithms for insight, or also actually generating actual insight from the data itself? Thank you for the question. The, this purpose of this particular data jam was to generate insight on the technical access pathways that we were um, prototyping, as well as the documentation, the components of the documentation, what might be missing um, from, from, for real users, the challenges that they face every day. Um, we heard a lot about the ways they'd like to connect with other data sources. We also heard about uh, many of the ways that they felt that subject matter expertise and connection to our colleagues would be really imperative. We do think as a part of establishing the data.labs.loc.gov sandbox, uh, a space, this could be a great space for continuing to document uh, and share machine learning training data, which is a, obviously a broad call across the community and a place where we, as uh, to this point, have only been able to share via GitHub repositories and contextualize within those uh, types of projects. So we're kind of looking at this as a step by step by step, different types of users, what's uh, useful for us, and then as we work with vendors and, and continue to improve our acquisitions vehicles, that we are taking the outcomes of that and making that useful for our own purposes and for a broader community. So that was the earlier question was just a preamble. One of the challenges in this space is everything is moving so quickly that by the time you finish a project, you would never have used the technologies that you started with. And I'm wondering if you can both opine about how you've built in that tolerance for change or future proofing, or if you don't care, uh, and why not? Well, I think these are human problems as much as they are technical problems. So having mechanisms to have knowledge exchange with 
uh, people who are practicing at the forefront as well as people who are uh, stewarding and um, staying connected to traditional practices is a, a great spot to be in. Again, we are lucky to be situated in an experimental context that allows us to uh, carve out a little bit of space for that. Um, but I do agree people ask us, are you using this method or have you, uh, what do you think about that method? And my answer is we're really far from, <laughs> we're not the ones who are implementing this, we are creating space for other people to tell us what we need to do to be more useful or effective for those methods. Yeah, for us, uh, in response to your earlier question, I think it would be us running MLAI jobs for people on our collection is gonna be way behind the curve of what we could do by brokering partnerships with the AI firms themselves to get subsidized access to the APIs or whatever and potentially share data and do it that way. So it's mostly through partnerships with the AI firms, which we're talking to, to try to figure out how that can be useful to libraries and the scholarly community instead of trying to take their tools and run it ourselves, which are always gonna be at least a couple of years behind, right? Yeah, and I think that some, um, you know, thinking about the organizational profile and the sort of discovery at scale quadrant, I think that it's not really cutting edge uh, technology that we have to concern ourselves with there. Um, so I think it's okay to be behind the curve as long as, long as we're documenting what we're doing along the way. I guess the only thing I have to add, if we're all going to add something, <laughs> is um, in, in terms of the portions of the project that I've worked on, um, we've completely rewrote the underlying platform, like I want to say two or three times. Like it started off as Apache Pig uh, when I first started on the project in what, like 2016 or whatever with Workbase, and it's, it's evolved. Um, but it's the same basic underlying, I guess, algorithms. It's just moving them into a different language or framework or whatever. All right, I think we're over time anyway. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.